Hey guys, thanks for joining us here at the Fly Shop today. I'm Mike Mercer and I'm going to be tying a uh, missing link dry fly today. A fly I invented about eight years ago and it's been a, a great pattern for me. I thought I'd start um, before we actually jump into the fly telling a little story kind of background. And it, it, my point being just that I think as fly tires and fishermen we need to keep an open mind when we fish flies and, and create flies. Um, I'm reminded a few years ago I was fishing in Montana, High Mountain Lake, and it's a little pond basically that I fished for years and always done very well with hoppers and specific nymphs there and large rainbows in it. And um, for whatever reason this day, they just wouldn't eat any of the normal suspects. They wouldn't eat hoppers. They wouldn't eat the standard Calabatus nymphs. They were cruising, clearly eating, but I tried fly after fly after fly, nothing worked. All the stuff that made sense, nothing. So finally in desperation, I was searching through my boxes and I found this little weird nymph I'd tied years before with a bright rainbow bead and it was a little soft hackle and it, it made no sense to me for the situation, but I tried everything else and nothing worked. So I put it on and I cast out and immediately caught a large rainbow. I thought, wow, that's interesting. So I tried it again and as I stripped the fly, the rainbows would come right up to it, but when I stripped, they would fade off. And so what I found out was that I would cast ahead of the fly, ahead of the cruising fish, let the fly just sink, and that's what they wanted. They wanted this bizarre looking fly that made no sense for the circumstances, and they wanted a dead drift. A, 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 a retrieved fly, and this was a soft tackle. So the whole thing about soft tackles is that the high tackles breathe with current or with motion. They don't want that. And so I went on just to just cruise, just hammer these fish with this stupid little nymph that I don't, can't remember why I tied it. And um, so the point being, when I first came up with the missing link, I tied it for a very specific niche. I, I wanted to tie a fly that looked like a dead cat's because out in the, our local fishery here, the lower Sacramento River, these fish in the summer nights come, come out almost every night and after the cat is due their egg laying, they fall the water dead and dying and the fish really get on them. And so I've always had kind of intermittent success with the standard flies like elk hair caddis and um, different common dry flies. And I wanted to create something that, that imitated that very specific niche that would just hopefully catch me a few more fish. So um, I designed the fly, fished it. It was amazingly successful. But if I had just stopped there, I never would have known how cool of a little fly this was because in years to come I came to realize that if anything it was a better mayfly um, pattern than it is a caddis pattern even, or it's equally good. And so I guess my point being just we need to keep open minds. If I'd stopped and only used this fly for a dead caddis imitation, I would have missed it. I mean that's such a little narrow window of success. I would have realized there was something um, about this fly, which was a total fluke from, from my point as a tire, but that uh, just instills a sense of confidence in fish. And they just eat it, I mean, amazingly well, whether it's a mayfly hatch, a caddis hatch, small stones, flying ants, you name it. They just, they just eat it really, really well. So with that, let's start tying it. I'll kind of just explain as I go through. That's a little picture of a finished fly there, but I'll just kind of explain the process as I go through. And, what I was thinking when I tied it and, and what I've, I've kind of discovered along the way. So I started with a, uh, a hook that I like. It's a 102Y, Tiemco 102Y. Um, I like it because it's a wide gap. Um, it's, if we use a small hook, it still has a wide gap and it's really effective on, on hooking fish. The one thing I would say about it, it's not a, a tremendously strong hook. So if you're catching really large fish in heavy current, um, I'd probably recommend going with a more traditional TMC 100, just a standard dry fly hook, a little more beef, a little more strength. Uh, on occasion, if I'm fishing for really big fish and heavy current, I'll even use a, a nymph hook, which has a lot of power. But this 102Y is a, is a great little hook. I just like it. It's thin wire. It penetrates real quickly into the fish's mouth. I tend to hook a lot more fish with it than a standard uh, hook. So uh, I usually use it. Not always, but I usually use it. Um, so I'll use um, the thread I like for this particular fly. I'm going to tie the traditional natural dark pattern today. Uh, I use a, a uni thread a dot is what I often want to use, but a lot of threads will work. And it's not that cr critical really. Try to stay that six aught eight aught size range and use a reddish brown color. 
I don't think the specific color is really that 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 critical, but fairly small thread. So I'll start about midway through the hook shank and just start wrapping back. Some point cut the tag. And the, the thread in this fly is actually a, 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 a an important part of the fly. It's a large part of this fly, the thread is not covered up by some other dubbing or material. It actually forms um, the part of the fly that I want. And unusually enough, I actually wind the thread back, well back into the hook bend. Um, almost halfway point through the, the bend, which is odd. Ah, usually you don't do that. Usually you want to keep it, you know, even with the hook point. But I want actually to create that curved look in the hook because that's going to be the abdomen of the fly. And when I first tied this fly, I wanted a, a dead caddis, remember? And so I wanted, uh, a, a, I wanted a part of the fly which would sink because dead caddis do start to immerse, sit down in the surface film. And so I knew that I wanted the back end of this fly to actually go down into the water and look like a, just a desiccated dead caddis body. And so I wanted to use the curvature of the hook shank for that and use that to kind of pierce the water film a little bit and get down in the water. Because fish are used to seeing these dead caddis you know, awash in the, in the, actually in the film. Next thing I wanted to, to really imitate is often caddis, really always caddis, when, even when they're dying, they have a lot of little hairs along their body. And those hairs tend to capture uh, air bubbles. And so even though you often think about this more along the lines of an emerger, having captured air bubbles, on their, on their bodies. Dead caddis do too, because again, those little hairs capture, capture air bubbles. And so I thought, well, how am I gonna do that? I thought dubbing is like, no, nah. the, the caddis body is like not much bigger than the, the diameter of a hook shank. You start putting dubbing on there, it gets kind of thick and I didn't want that. So I thought, well, you know, when a lot of my nymphs, I use a um, flashaboo rib. And I wanna, I kinda wanna use that here too, because I think it'll create that effect. So I tied a single strand of pearl flashaboo and very often, particularly on smaller sizes, 16s, 18s, and 20s, one thing I'll do, because there's not a lot of hook shank to work with, I'll actually stretch the flash of it. Because if I, on, a, on a number 18, if I just wrap, if I just wrap it like this, the flash of is actually too wide and, and I can't get a ribbed effect that I'm trying for. I just get just a flash of body. So I'll actually take and stretch this flash of and it makes it a lot thinner. So I can get, now it's thinner, I can, wrap it and I can get both a flashaboo rib and I can see the thread body through it, which is what I'm trying to achieve here. So I wrap it forward evenly, capture the flashaboo, clip that off. Now I have basically what's just a, a ribbed body, a ribbed abdomen um, with the thread as the base. So I've got dark and light, so to speak. And because that flashaboo is not particularly uh, durable, I knew at this point I needed to put something on there to keep the fish's teeth from just breaking the 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 flash of the rib. So I at the initial I used Softex, which still works great. Softex is a good product. I've kind of started using this Loon Flow product now because it's so quick and easy. It doesn't smell bad, and there's just kind of a lot I like about it. So I'll take and I'll put that flow on all parts of that rib abdomen. Use my UV light, just make it set up, which takes about 15, 20 seconds. Just hit it really well. And it'll set that, that, that flow so it's just hard immediately and you can just keep wrapping the, keep wrapping the fly, tying the fly. So I want enough flow on there so it creates a little bit of a 3D look. So it's kind of a transparent body, like an actual insect would be, uh, but not so much that it, it oozes off and gets drippy and that sort of thing just enough to protect that rib and kind of give it a, a real look, a 3D look. So touch it, it's hard, it's set up. So. so the next thing I wanted, and this is I think a pretty key part of the fly, is I wanted to have back wings, like a, a spinner pattern. Um, so you could have, so the fish actually sees wings of a dead caddis down in, kind of messy like they really are in real life, out to the side, kind of delta style. And I know that they see cats like that a lot. It's not just all the classic upwind cats. So for that, I wanted to use an Antron yarn. You can use Zilon or straight Antron. Doesn't really matter. Just um, just a, a dark gray Antron style yarn. Really, Zilon is just Antron, so to speak. So um, as with mayfly spinners, you can. It's easy to overdo this. You want 
Again, you're, you're trying to imitate just a small, kind of a gauzy, messed up looking wing that's, that's caught in the surface film. Um, I would say usually, you know, if, you, if you use 10, 12 strands, uh, which looks like almost nothing, that's going to be appropriate. Uh, don't, don't take and use the whole big strand of, of, of you know, full rope of yarn way, way too much. You want this wing to kind of move a little bit in the water too. So 10, 12 strands. And before I wrap it in, I'm actually going to put a little dubbing ball. And I use uh, UV ice dub, um, UV brown. I don't think the color is tremendously important, to be honest. It's just a color I've used in a lot of flies over the years, and I have a lot of confidence in it. And when we tie or fish, confidence is important. It does give it a little bit of, a little flash. And so I'm going to build just a, not, not a, not a, a tapered dub body or anything. I'm only just taking and putting in, making a little ball right at the front end of the abdomen. And the reason for that is when I tie this Elon wing in, I want the wings to stick back but stay separate from the body. Because if I don't put this ball in, they'll just wrap right tight against the body and it ends up just looking like a tail basically. But I want very distinct wings out to the side of the fly. So I'll tie the, the Zelon in. You can, if you want, you can just wrap the yarn around the thread, tie it up. Now a key point of this fly, this is probably the most difficult part of tying this fly correctly, is that there's going to be a parachute hackle coming down the line here pretty quick. And if these wings are sticking up, like even with the hook shank or above the plane of the hook shank, that parachute hackle is going to grab these wings and you're going to get all messed up and it's kind of a nightmare. So when I tie these wings in, I actually kind of try to preen them down so they're actually um, pointing more down on either side of the hook shank. They don't have to be completely down, but just below the axis of that hook so that when I wrap that parachute, they're not going to be getting caught in it. So you can kind of see they're down below. And the wings, as far as length, I'll pull, them, I'll pull all that yarn back. Clip a little straight strand there. Um, pull them back tightly, and I'll clip them just about even with the, the, the far bend of the hook shank. You can be a little longer than that if you want, but that's about how long I want those wings. Just about body length, a little, little longer than body length. You can preen them down a little bit. You can see they're not heavy. It's just like a, almost a suggestion of a wing. And that's kind of what we're shooting for. So, at this point, it almost looks like a nymph or a spinner. This looks like a trico spinner or something. And it kind of is in a way. It kind of imitates that same dead and dying stage of just happens to be a caddis in this case. Um, and I knew it too, I, I needed something to hold the fly up in the surface film, let it, sit soft, let it sit deep, which the rest of this body will do. I want those wings down in the water. But I also needed something to hold it in the film and something that would allow the angler to see the fly um, on the water. And I really like uh, elk hair for that. So I use a, what, just a cow elk. The cow elk is neat. A lot of times, if you, if you notice, if you can see on this, the tips of the hair are pretty golden colored. And I really like that. A cow elk tends to be very blunt tipped. So if you use a hair that has long black tips, it's hard to control the length, you get too much hair. So I want very blunt tipped cow elk hair with a kind of deep waxy gold tip. And that way, the, the tip that you can see visually is the actual tip of the hair. And it's not, there's not still some long black hair um, extending past that, which kind of fouls up the fly. So I'll clip some of that hair usually more than I think I need. Um, strip the under fur, I actually like just to kind of like flick that hair and gets all that nasty under fur out of there. And then because I want an even, kind of an even elk hair kind of style of wing on this, I'm gonna take a hair stacker, put the tips in the hair stacker, tips down, tap that a few times to, to even up the very tips of the hair. See it all nice evened up on the stacker. Grasp those. Measure them. Again, about, about shank length is what I'm shooting for here. And at this point, I usually bring my thread forward a little bit. I want to build a thread base so that when I tie this elk hair in, it's not just on an uh, empty hook shank, which will tend to want to slide. So if I have a little bit of a thread base, the hook 
elk here will want to stay in place a little bit more where I want it, which is on top of the hook shank. So kind of measure it, and you'll notice I'm not tying it right against the, the wings in the dubbing ball either. I'm, I've moved forward a little bit on the hook shank. It's okay to be halfway to the, to the eye on this. I do want to keep a fair amount of open hook shank from the eye back, but you don't have to tie this step, step in right against the wings. So tie that, bring the thread over loose once, get the second time bring it around, and now I'll actually wrap some tension, wrap back, forth. Um, I'm actually creating a little tie down area between where the, the hook, sh where the, the tapered ends go over the back of the hook and where these blunt ends go over the, over, the, over the eye of the hook. And there's a reason for that. A lot of times you don't want this when you tie. A lot of times you want as little thread as possible, but in this case I actually want that tie down area. And so, and I'll tell you why in just a sec. At this point, I've got my wing over the back. It's going to be easy for, for people to see this fly down because it sits up above the water. Plus, it gives a silhouette to the fish. It looks like there may be some more wings, not just down wings, but some up wings too to, as the bug struggles and is dying. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to lift this, all this hair up. There's blunt forward ends. And I'm going to take and clip it, but, but leave some of those blunt ends sticking out like over the eye. And the reason that I created that, that little bit of thread in between the blunt ends and the wings is because now I'm going to tie a parachute hackle in. And the parachute hackle is going to go underneath both the wings and the blunt forward ends. And if I don't have some thread in there, they're going to just collapse upwards completely. And, and, the, and it doesn't really work for me. I want these blunt ends pointing forward because sometimes I'll skate this pattern. Usually dead drift, but if I skate it, these blunt ends help me to help keep the fly up on top of the water. You can skate and drop, skate and drop. Without these blunt ends, the fly's gonna wanna dive. Because it's, as you can see, there's not a lot to this fly. It's fairly sparse. And if you just had a straight thread head, it's just gonna wanna dive under like a web fly. So these are important. Um, I'll tie the hackle. I don't have a good reason for this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna use a dark dun hackle. Uh, not a lot of thought process way of this, to be honestly. When I first tied this fly, I reached in my hackle, on my hackles, and I thought, huh, done. I don't use done very much. I'll try that. Um, and, it, and the fly works so well, I've just said, I'm never going to change it. <laughs> so I can't claim there was any great thought process behind that. But, um, done does seem to work really well, and I like dark done uh, as well. So I'll take, and I, I've, I've stripped off the fuzz up the bottom of the hackle, right up to the first of the really good dry fly quality um, feather. And I'll tie it in. Generally speaking, I'll tie the concave sides up more. I tie it on my side of the hook. Reach down in there. Put that little bare stem against the, the, the thread tie-down area. And then tie it down firmly. And I'll actually come, at this point, come in front of the, those little blunt tips and bring my thread right in front. And so my thread is in front, is in behind the eye and is now ready to tie the parachute hackle down. Don't worry if it looks a little messy at this point. It's not that big a deal. You can always kind of fix that later. But again, here at this point, you want to try to make sure your Antron wings are down. I'm not going to get, not going to get wrapped up with this hackle. Again, I'll kind of preen them down at this point. Sometimes we'll even go to the extent of, of taping, just a piece of tape, and, and tape those wings down below, below, the, below the, the, the shank, actually, which is fine. It works. It's one more step, but if it helps you, that's that's a worthwhile doing. So again, this hackle goes not just beneath the upwing, but underneath those little tips too. And you can see when I did that, when I started wrapping the elk hair taper stick straight up in the air, looks a little odd, but that's exactly what you want. It gives a really great profile to the fish and the angler. Usually I'm gonna go around there about four times. And capture that thread with the eye of the hook. I'll wrap that a few different, a couple, few different times. And again, don't worry about stray fibers at this point. It's not that big a deal. That's what scissors are made for. Just get it captured well. Bring that off. For now, because I hand work finish, I'll just pull everything up. There's the 
fly. I see there is some stuff right over the hook guy. I'll take clean that up. And that's the fly. So that's a missing link. Um, again, tied originally to imitate a, a dead, dying caddis dry after the after the after they've actually taken and and, and done their egg laying stage. Um, now I use it almost primarily for mayflies. It's become my number one go-to pattern for emerging and and uh, done mayflies for spinners. Uh, any any mayfly spinner hatch it works fantastic on. Plus, you get the advantage of being able to see the fly in the water, which generally spinners go invisible. So that's the bug. A lot of people will use it in different colors, which is great. Uh, I do use it in a PMD color a lot, kind of a yellow color. This dark brown body, though, if I had to pick one color, would certainly be this. And I do think that in many cases, uh, fish eat that, 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 that the back abdomen underneath the water. I think they take it for a shuck. Um, at first, I just thought it was going to be a little body. But I think in the case of a mayfly hatch, they think that's a shuck. And with that, that flash of a rib, it gives that effect of a, of a ribbed shuck with air trapped inside. And then the rest of the fly looks like a mayfly kind of bursting out the front with the wings coming up and starting to dry, that sort of thing. So great pattern. I just wrote an article on Fly Fisherman in there. I mentioned I use it for everything. It truly is. I've never had a dry fly that I use for everything. Like most people, I always used a lot of parachute atoms and healthcare caddis and cutters caddis and had my favorites. And I'd use healthcare, I'd use a lot of rusty spinners. And when this fly, I started realizing what it does and how it inspires confidence in feeding fish, I basically just always reach for this fly first. It's been my, my go to fly for a number of years now for everything. So, hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, appreciate you making time to watch it, and I hope it helps you in your fly time.